sort of thing for Jewies, Trag Jew, live baiting for Sokovia, the whole work. So it's going to be a bit of everything tonight. So um, just to show our hands, who's here mainly to learn about float lines and snapper? Okay, probably more than half here. So we'll probably put most of the time into that because that's the way to catch the biggest snapper, more than bottom bashing, right? Um, and who wants to learn about catching pearl is bottom fishing? Yeah, so, uh, okay, so, okay. And who, who wants to learn about catching jewies offshore? Mile away. You should all be throwing your hands up yeah. on that one. Because <laughs> that's, that's what's happening at the moment. They're happening at the moment as well. We're at this week in quarter on Monday, Tuesday, on both days. Right? Yeah. Um, and um, so jewies are good. And the cobia are starting now as well. So they, they come through winter. Once the whales turn up, which is next month, the cobia turn up. So it's everything going on. So you need to, tonight, have to get it all right and you guys can get into it and go and, go and do it. Okay, so we're going to start on the majority of the time it's going to be float line for snapper first, I think, Stuart. So the reason why we knew the snapper on because I went out uh, maybe a month ago and uh, we had a few customers catch them as well. Um, but we were fishing for mackerel and, and, um, and the mackerel down deep, they weren't on the top, they were down deep on the 18s at the front end. So we just put a little bit of weight on our uh, wire rigs and, and the bloody snapper eating the wire rigs, which is really weird. And they're like three to five or seven kilos. And... Uh, so then we went out the next day, rigged up for snapper, thought we'd get into them, but the mackerel bit us off all the time. So, and the day before, we never caught many mackerel. The day we went out with Stuart, we caught mackerel. We did get one snapper yeah. about, I think about five kilos, I, I guess. A couple, but yeah. Yeah, a couple, quite a yeah. few actually. But um, it was really windy, but the mackerel were um, not biting the wire rig, so we caught them on gang hooks just by accident. So, and the snapper were there as well. So, as I was saying, it's hard to do both, but try and mm. do the best we can for you. Yep. So what's a float line mean? It doesn't mean it sits on the surface, it means it's on the bottom, but your line's waffling down, your filter's waffling down really slowly, and that's what big snapper like. They don't like like a, a sinker like that ripping past their head, and they wouldn't be able to know what's going on, I guess, and so it hits the bottom, the little ones attack it. Deeper water, different scenario. 100 metres, the big snapper don't mind that type of system, but in close, under, say, under 70 metres, uh, float lining is always the best way to catch a snapper. So in saying that, the line is uh, important to have the right size line to the area fishing and it's important to have the right size sinker to the area fishing based upon wind and current. So you need to understand wind and current, how that works as well. So when it's blowing like, um, uh, you know, say 15 knots from the southeast and you've got current coming from the north down, it's going to make the water a little bit choppy. So the waves are going to, like pressure waves on the seaway, right? They sort of stand up and roll a little bit. That's because wind's against current, okay? So, but you need to back up into the wind. But when you back up into the wind, you get a fair bit of water over the back because it's quite rough. Um, and in that sort of scenario, um, you can't use too light a sinker because it just will never get to the bottom. So you have to up the ante to a heavier sinker. So when you get that perfect day though, and it's like five knots, and there's not much current, or it'll give you a bit of current, um, and uh, the line's pretty all straight down. Uh, my suggestion is if you're going to drift is to cast up current, so up into the wind or up into the current. Um, I try and cast the distance of the depth. So if, it, if I'm in 40 metres deep, I'm trying to cast up 40 metres. And then I'm using a spin reel similar to around a 4,000 sort of, sort of size reel, which is what Stewie's got there. And a fairly light tip, about 30 pound braid is what I run on that sort of stuff. Um, 20 or 30. And I'm fishing out to about 60 or 70 metres with that type of outfit. And in close, I'm using this little lot, tiny sinker here, which is about, uh, I think, around a quarter or a half ounce. Yeah, it's three-eighths. Oh, three-eighths yeah. in between. Okay. I'll pass that around, Stuart. Um, that's the sort of size I'll use on those perfect days. And I'm running that straight onto two snell hooks or a gang hook or two gang hook. And recently we've been using, you would have seen with us throwing these things, these uh, dress gang hooks. Um, the snapper have been going bonkers on these too, um, as has a mackerel. But if you just run that small sinker right above that and cast it up 40 metres and leave the bail arm open, okay? If you go to overhead, leave the uh, free spool on and just let it, it'll, it'll, it won't pull off much, it'll just slowly trickle away and maybe the wind or the current might actually pull off most of the line, a bit of a bell in your line. Um, but eventually, it'll, when it catches up to the boat drifting, um, it'll be nearly straight down. At that point there, on those really nice days, um, you should get hit. Your line should flick off really fast, particularly at first light in the morning. 
um, or um, if it goes past the back of the boat and you don't get a hit within that sort of, it gets like that angle behind the boat, that point you need to reverse up on it. So it comes back down like that, even go a bit past it and you're in the zone. If it's on the bottom at that point, my suggestion is you wind it up about probably 10 metres and then open the bale and let it free fall back down again 10 metres. Just don't want it too fast though because you don't want to wreck the bait presentation up. You want to keep it really clean. So just steadily just wind it back up about one. If you're using colour line, one colour. Okay. So wind up 10 metres and then open the bale up and just set it free fall as it goes back past the boat and you should get hit straight away. Sometimes when you um, go to wind it up and you've got the rod, the rod holder and as soon as you get that first turn you actually get a hit. But they're watching it and as soon as they see it move they'll grab it. And that happens sometimes too. At that time be prepared. Make sure your drag's not too light or not too heavy. Have it set perfect, it's a nice pull off. And when you strike, it's going to be the right thing. Um, those big snap. How do you. Um, look, it's. Um, I do it by feel. But for, for you guys, if you want to do it on a set of drag scales, um, I'd probably had about, around about three kilos on sort of 30 pound braid. There's probably plenty. It's, it's sort of like a firm pull. Yeah, if you're using 50 pound braid, you might rip it up to five kilos. Those big snapper will try and do you on the bottom. Um, they'll try and go, they know, they know their way. And I, I keep mentioning this on every seminar we do on snapper, but um, has anyone ever seen the Ross uh, uh, jet ski YouTube guy? He's, he's got a video of a snapper with a uh, wolf cam. Yeah, wolf? water wolf. Water wolf like cam, that, yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, on the, on the bait, now it's just out in the 24s, out in the diamond reef, I think it was. It's a few years nah, old. It's a few years yeah. old, correct, but there's a yeah. best way to, to see what they do. So he got this massive snapper, it's like 90 and 8 kilos or 10 kilo. But when the snapper hit the bait and it knew exactly this little crevice that wide, in the, in the rock's probably two metres high, and another one's two metres high, and this little crevice, and it just went straight down to that crevice and went, swam through the crevice and tried to break him off, but it, it didn't get him, but he actually pulled it back out. But you could see the snapper just beeline straight to it. So that's what they do. So if you get a chance to watch it, uh, Ros Jet Roscoe Jet Ski YouTube, I think this is on my jet ski fishing. I'll pass that again to you. Uh, but anyhow, so that they so you get bricked a lot. Simple as that. Um, the problem is if you go too heavy a line and you've got too much current or too much wind, you'll never get down there. You can use bigger sinkers, you can put on something around sort of an ounce and a half, that sort of size which I like to use on the 36 fathoms. So that little one going around, um, I wouldn't use that out on 36 fathoms or 65 metres. I'd be using something around an ounce to an ounce and a half. It needs to get down, otherwise it'll never get down there. So you defeat the purpose. So it's all relative, it's all slow fall. You don't just go whoomp into the bottom, like I said. It's just got to go down nice and slowly. So when it goes past its head, or, or it can, it can, it's got time to swim up to it and grab it while it's slowly free falling. And that's the secret to catch all your biggest snapper. If you use a pattern Oster, you'll still get the odd big snapper, but you won't get the numbers you get float lining. When we, I'll pass it on to you. When we fish down 50 fathoms in float lining, um, the least I'd use would be about a four ounce, which is, that, which is like a 10 ball or an eight ball. Okay, um, so there, that's actually a, a nine or 10 ball. Yeah, so they're um, same deal again, you're using that on a bit bigger reel, so a bit bigger than a 4,000. I wouldn't use that size that, they'll be using more. Uh, an eight or a 10,000 uh, 50 pound braid because you've got chances of getting a big king on there or amberjack as well. And um, on that sort of like you, you'll get, you get hammered most times. Um, but it's the same scenario, it's that on top of that dress hook going around or gang hook or two snell hooks. And it's slowly going down in that water column. It looks a lot bigger and should sink fast, but you're talking um, 90 metres or whatever instead of 30 metres or whatever. So it's a lot more column to get down. So um, when it does get down in the zone, obviously it's going to be a little bit faster falling than, than that light sinker going down, of course. But that's the sort of size you use. Yeah, so it will overtake the bait. The bait will pull up a little bit, as you're saying. It doesn't actually sort of hold the bait and go down with the bait. So you do get that scenario. And you hopefully get a, a hit on the way down or pretty close to the bottom because once it hits the bottom, the bait will get tangled up a fair few times. If you put a swivel above it, though, the problem there is, and that you might have a bit of a lead and the, and the sinker um, between the swivel and the hook, say, 
Um, it can pull it through there, but once it feels the weight of the, of the swivel and, and the sinker stops, it then takes the weight of the sinker and it may try and not hit it hard or spit it out or whatever it might be. And other times it'll still take it. It depends how hungry they are. And if you have the sinker above the swivel and run a trace like that, that always gets tangled up as well. So um, it's, it's, all, it's all about hoping you get a hit before it hits the bottom. <laughs> and it's a clean fall. Yeah. And a lot of time, like a lot of time with float lining, if it's gone past the back of the boat and I back up on it and I wind it up a bit and I drop back down again, out there I'll, I'll pull it actually in. Um, so it'll be about 10 metres in, um, say, 40 metres deep, I'll pull it up. Uh, 70 metres I'll bring up probably maybe 20 metres and then uh, 100 metres or 90 metres or 80 metres is out in the 50s. Um, I'll probably want three colours, so 30 metres up. Then drop it back down, open the bale up, let it free fall and, uh, and back up on it so it's pretty well free falling at the same time. Just a little bit of backing up. You have to back, how many people ha haven't backed up on their lines yet? You haven't backed up? Yeah, so you need to learn to do it maybe, but you just got to be careful of the props. Props are bad. And uh, if you've got mates that turn around and talk like that, and the line goes into the prop, it's bad too. <laughs> so you've got to make sure everyone's focused on the weather motors. Right. Yeah. Including the driver of the boat too. But that's normally the person, if you can drive it and fish at the same time, that's normally you. So just keep an eye on it. Um, so, that's the technique. The, the next thing is, before we do it, the rig, we talked a bit about the rig, but there's a lot of different rigs. So um, you can use a two hook, um, like a true turn type setup. They're very, very popular, and I use them myself. Stu uses them as well. They're very good. And I like to use a peely. I cut about, of the WA peely, I cut about probably that much of it off. So it's cut just behind the dorsal sort of thing. So the hook's sort of up a bit from the end, and then a hook's through the head. Um, a lot of blood comes out. It doesn't spin, there's no tail on there, it just free falls really nicely. And I believe they, they want that because there's so much oil and crap coming out of the, out of the bait and the way down. It works really well. Um, Black Magic do some rigs as well um, that you can use. Um, they call them stray line rigging, we call it flow lining. It's the same, same thing, same technique. Okay, um, I'll pass these around as well. I do small and big sizes, all different sizes. Um, Flesh bait's good as well, but filters are by far the best. Um, slimy mackerel's not too bad. Um, yakas, yakka fillets are really good. Slimy fillets are really good. Tailor fillets are really good. Mac tuna fillets are really good. So if you catch mac tuna, and you don't want to eat it, don't want to feed it to the cat, dog. Dogs do love mac tuna though. Um, I'd just um, cut strips about the size of two fingers sort of thing and run the two hooks through it. Okay. Um, then the next thing is like the the dressing of the hook. So I don't know what it is, but we never, well, years ago, I did used to use Lumo skirts on my, I'm talking about 30, 40 years ago, I used to use Lumo skirts on my gang hooks and catch big snap from My dad always said to me, yeah, what do you, you don't need that crap on there, <laughs> like that sort of thing, because at those days the fish are pretty, pretty hungry anyhow. But I always tried di something different. And then these days, I'm not saying the fish have got more educated, but, but they have, but it, it's a little bit different to, it's not as easy as you used to catch them. So. Uh, we use these little things here, like little skirts like that, um, Lumo type stuff, uh, beads, tube, definitely uh, skirts like this above the hooks is really, really good. I don't know if it emulates a little squid or a, or a um, whatever it is. I might just get Stewie to put this on, a, um, on that maybe if he wants to and pass it around. Lumo hooks are really good. So um, these hooks, the hooks you got in your bag are made uh, from BKK, they're Shinto branded, uh, they're Lumo, and that's what we do on our rigs, all our little rigs like Stu's got there, which we sell hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, um, uh, Lumo hooks. Does it make the difference? Mentally, you feel more reassured, <laughs> but <laughs> no, it does, it makes a difference. Um, that's, so just using a little skirt like this there as well, let's go, let's go a little red skirt on there, but we'll just put this on to show how it works. And when it's going down, those little tentacles are, are like very natural. It's maybe they think it's a little squid's eating the pilchard and they want to eat the whole lot. I don't know, but it definitely works. Yeah, so most of these skirts mm. do have like a little smaller hole on the top so you can kind of pull it over the, um, the top knot or the top of the eye of the hook and uh, it kind of locates it, holds it in. Um, but yeah, and as well, like these things here as well, if you are going to use big skirts and stuff like that, you might have to up your sinker size a little bit because there's a lot more drag in the water. It's not just two hooks with a single pilly in it. 
something very hydrodynamic that'll sink fast, all of this stuff's going to slow it down. <coughs> so instead of running that little three eighth, you might run a half. So just up so the size. But, yeah. yeah. So that's on 30 pound fluorocarbon as well. And uh, it's a good rig, that sort of thing. Um, that's another one there. So these, I'll just pass the basic one around as well without that thing on the But just copy the, you got the hooks there guys, and we sell the other bits and pieces downstairs, but just copy it. Okay. And if you run bare hooks, you're still going to catch fish, but I believe you'll catch more if you dress the hooks. Okay, just because it slows it down? It, it slows it down, which yeah. is a good thing, right? If you add too much weight to it, it'll actually speed up again. But um, if you've got no current, or a bit of current, but not much wind, um, definitely that's to go. Because it's even more slow in the column and you've got plenty of time for it to get down there. And I believe if you, you could definitely outfish anyone who's using the Patton Oster or a bigger sinker. Um, even though you take a lot longer to get down than he's already got the bottom pulled up to little baby squire, um, you're still going to get the better fish, right? And out, be out doing him. So you're right, yeah, slow, slow is good. Would you read this with the head up? Head, uh, head up. Oh, I put the head at the top. Yep, correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry. Good question. So I always put the hook in first. So just th there's enough line on there to not have it bent or stretched. So just work out roughly. You'll know straight away by doing a few times roughly where the hook goes in. Yeah. Um, I didn't bring any pills to see to put on, but should we grab a pillie and rig one up? If Ms. Arco's watching, <laughs> if you can grab us a, a couple of pillies, that'd be great, thanks. I was talking to the TV thing. <laughs> thanks, Dan. Um, but anyhow, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll rig up a couple and pass it around on those same rigs at uh, about another 15 minutes time when they defrost. Um, so, yeah, then there's like glow beads and stuff. We'll use those more on, um, on our Pat Noster, which we'll show you later on. So, um, any questions on that part of it all? Right, everyone's good? Okay. So, braid. So, we've talked about the bottom part of it, but lining up the braid. Uh, look, as we always talk about, the braid technology is getting better and better and better, okay? So, what was once 15 pounds, now 30. What was 30 is now 60 for the same thickness. So it enables you to fish a lot lighter braid and get down in that column much easier fishing lighter sinkers. You don't need such a big sinker to drag it down. So um, I'll pass this around. This is um, 30 pound. You have a feel of it. Oops. And uh, you can see how thin it is and it's strong enough to catch quality fish. You could also go catch brim with it, <laughs> believe it or not. So, and, and the braid's getting so tight in the weave, it actually feels like mono now. There's no like bump, 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 bump. It's very smooth. So you cast much easier, goes down the water and colour much easier, etc., etc. And it doesn't hold much water like braid. That old cheap braid generally holds a lot of water in it. Um, it doesn't, so it's a lot, pulls up better than the water column. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you some heavy braid. We're going to do the bottom fish in a bit later, the deeper one. Um, Hook-wise, so I generally use around 5 O's to 7 O's. If you want to snail your own hooks up, you've got the Luma ones there. Um, I think you've got some of these fellows here, which are wizard hooks. These are made in Korea. These are good hooks. They're not crap. Um, and the, the 7 O's I use for fishing out in the deep water. Um, I'm using, I'm not using 30 pound leader out in the deep water either, guys. I'm using 50 or 60. So the reason being, as I said before, there's a good chance you're going to get um, a, a big kingy grab it or a big amberjack. Or a big snapper, though. But it's going to be decent. So 30 pounds is not going to cut the grade. It'll get broken off or bitten off or all the above. So my hook size is a bit bigger out there, 7 O's, OK? Or 6 O's. 6 O's, 7 O's. Um, on the same pilly, same deal there, just bigger hooks. Heavier hardware, heavier line, bigger. Still float lining, obviously. Yeah, still float lining? Yes. Yeah, still float. Yes, correct. Yeah, so using like a, a six to ten thousand size reel, yeah. uh, fifty pound braid, at least, um, and uh, fifty to sixty pound leader, and just running the bigger sinkers, like a four ounce. So, so how many people here fish out in that on the fifty fathom reef? How many guys have fished out there? Okay, how many guys have boats over four point eight? Nearly all of you. So you guys are, you should be able to get out there on on the weather. To, Please be careful of the weather. Here she is. She's so good. Thanks, though. 
Very good. <laughs> Glad you got the message. Oh, dinner served. Here goes, Julia. You, you got fed tonight, mate. You're well. Well done. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Um, so we'll go through this. We'll set these defrosts. We'll grab a couple out. So two are probably enough at the moment. Um, yeah, so um, if, if your boat's four... This is to me, if you know what you're doing, like a boat 4.8 metres, most boats that size are 16 foot, they can handle it. Um, years ago, 80s, 90s, 2000, everyone had a 16 foot Clark or a 15 foot 6 BC, and everyone went to the 50s. Everyone sort of knew what they could do, and the trouble those days, the fuel tanks weren't very big, and it was all plastic fuel tanks, and it was 20 litres, and you had three of them in the boat. But you need fuel capacity. So if you've got, say, uh, say you've got a 4.8 with a 90 in the back, um, you probably need at least 60 litres of fuel or 80 litres of fuel to go out there and back. It's 40 k's one way, OK? Um, you're only about 25 k's off the shoreline if you go north, but you're, it's a 40 k run up. If you go east, it's about nearly uh, 30, 35, 40 k's east. It's a little bit different because the bottom's a bit different out. It gets closer up north and it gets closer down south, but at the front here, it's a, it's a wide run house. So it's nearly, it's far, that's why most people go northeast because the fishing's better because it's perceived as being further away, but it's actually the same distance as going east fishing. Pretty well. Okay. Um, for those of you who have got boats under 4.8 metres, um, I would definitely say, uh, well, Chris goes to 50 fathoms and you're happy to do yours, Chris? 4.5. 4.5, but Chris knows what he's doing. He's, he's learnt the hard way. He's done some big days out there in big weather and um, understands his boat. It's all about understanding your boat and your scare factor <laughs> and, uh, and safety, of course, is paramount, So and fuel capacity. You know, once you learn all that and know what your boat can do, um, then you can go and try these other deeper water fishing places. Okay. Um, if your boat's heading, say, uh, four metres, um, are you definitely are you in close, as long as the swell's not big and the seaway's not too bad, you're fine. You've got to be safety gear, of course. Um, if your boat's four and a half metres, I'd definitely go out to the 36 fathoms on a good day. Again, as long as it's good weather and it's all good. Okay. Um, so, get to know your boat. If your boat's six metres, you can go anywhere you want. Pretty well. Depending on the weather. This weekend, though, the weather looks crap. Have you seen the weather? It's like 40 knots on yeah. Sunday. Mm. Sunday, Monday, yeah. It Sunday, Monday. Real bad. Yeah, it's a bit of a lower here, I think. So, um, but we've had four days of good weather. But so this time of the year, the weather does sort of get a little bit better. Not not looking today though. But you know, in, in tradition, April, May is still um, rainy, and low systems and stuff like that still happening. So, really, June, July it starts to get better. Is it after the lows, the snapper come on after yeah, that? Yeah, they do. They come on in close. So you'll get snapper in the seaway even if you get a big swell, which I think we will. Um, but uh, if you if the swell once once the swell drops off in close, you can get out through the seaway. Um, I'll just sit the 18 fathoms straight out the front, and that's on the. We'll go through those marks a bit later tonight, but yeah, it's, it, it's to go. And you'll get big snapper fish floaters oh, or float lining, sorry. And um, yeah, you can't miss. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Um, so any questions on the Float lining anywhere, all good? Everyone's good? Okay. Okay, yeah, good question. You've been asking drifting versus anchoring? I'd like to be like that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah so um, look, if I know the spot really well, and I, cause I hate re anchoring, because uh, especially early in the morning, because it takes you about 15 minutes to, if you miss it, to pull the anchor back up and drop it back out again. It's probably been 20 minutes by the time you get your lines in the water. So unless I can do it spot on, I've got someone with me that knows that when exactly when to drop the anchor. And a lot, a lot of people don't know how to anchor properly. So when they throw that, when they pull up to the spot and they know the spot's there, they just throw the chain and anchor in the water. If you've got a drum line, that's fine, that's perfect. But if you're hand doing it, um, they just throw it in the water and they'll let out a heap of rope, all loose, and then they'll say, that's, I know where it is, so they'll tie it off. They'll get in the back and they start get their rods ready, whatever. And then it's not until they don't get any bites, they look at the GPS and they've moved like 200 metres off the mark. So what it's all about is when you drop the anchor, someone has to be on the anchor the whole time and, and letting it, tethering it out through your hand so it doesn't get any slack, can't get any slack. 
So at the moment that reef anchor hits the water and the chain has to go through your hand, the rope has to go through your hand, you cannot, because what happens is the chain overtakes the anchor and then it gets fouled up or it gets pulled backwards and it can't set in. But if you um, do that and then the second guy, the other guy, if you've got two of you that is, um, if you've got one who's a bit hard, <laughs> but if you've got two, um, the other guy needs to be on the helm and keeping the nose into the wind and keeping the boat dead straight. Because once it goes sideways again, it's very hard to anchor, even some right, to grip in. So you need to actually keep on, the, keep on there. Your anchor's gone down, straight down. The guy's holding it the front here and it's under tension. It's just going down nice and slowly. And you're pretty well watching, your, the guy on the other end's watching the plotter and he knows exactly the reef's just here. The boat's here now. The line's straight down. It's, the guy's thinking it's hit the bottom. At that point, you can strip out a bit of loose line, right? Because it's got to be laying nicely and strip out a bit of loose uh, anchor line, sorry. And then the spot's here, you're about here. And at that point, you've kept the nose of the boat into the wind, you kept everything perfect. And at that point, you, you might think, okay, I just might just nudge the boat forward a little bit because it hasn't hooked on. It's sort of like bouncing. You can feel it bouncing at the bottom and hitting on rocks or whatever. Just, put, just drive forward a bit and put a little bit of a bow in your rope and it gives it time to actually really sit nice and loose on the bottom and then hopefully grab in. But if it's tight and sort of pulling it with the, with the hooks up the wrong way, it's very hard to get it in. So You're talking about using a reef anchor. Reef anchor, correct, that's right. So that uh, the sand as well? Uh, no, you, got, you, you want to be on reef to hook on reef. Yeah, but right. yeah. So if you're on a spot where it's one rock and then 100% use a sand anchor or a plough and reverse it around the other way, yeah, yeah so it doesn't get fouled because you can't straighten them out, if that makes sense. Unless we're going to cut it off. And I've tried, one time we did that and many years ago, um, we didn't reverse it, we just dropped it down. It was a bit of a last minute thing to go out fishing. Hadn't fixed it up from the last time we did Hadn't re, um, redone the shackle back to the front to the back of the anchor, sorry. And then we pull the chain across, across to the front and zip tie it, right? So it's pulling from that end, but it's actually attached to that end. So that end snaps off when you pull it up. Uh, but we had to, uh, other way around, got stuck on the bottom. It's actually a plow. And you go, so if you get your anchor stuck, has anyone here got their anchor stuck before on the bottom? Yeah. Can't get it. So let out a heap of rope. We let out about 30 metres of rope or 40 metres of rope. Make sure it's on, if, on the driver's side of the, of the boat, which is standing on the right side. And when you drive, so the anchor's there, so that, that's for you guys, the anchor's there, uh, and my rope's there. I'm going to drive off so that it's on, if, oh, sorry, on that side of the boat, yeah. I'm going to drive off so that the anchor line comes down my side of the boat as I'm driving forward. That's really important. And you do a big arc around, so just feel the weight of it. You'll start to feel the corner get pulled down a little bit. That's as far as you go on that arc. Don't go any further and go a big circle around and you'll feel it pop. If it doesn't pop, have one more crack around it, but be really careful you've got current, because if you've got current and you sort of go around and you sort of give up and you're facing um, into the current and you, let, and you throttle back, the back of the boat will get pulled under. You get a wave over the back into the boat. It's a bit scary. If it doesn't pop up, you can keep going down. <laughs> Especially if you've got self-draining, very scary. So um, my suggestion is, if you can't pop it off and do a few laps, I don't know, it's a hard one. You put it, cut it off and put a buoy on it and come back another time with a bigger boat and try and get it off. But you're better off doing that rather than risk pull the boat under or snapping something. I snapped it as I was getting back before. We got stuck in the reef and um, we did a big circle around, big circle around, couldn't get it. So it's got a bit more grunt and the, the whole bollard, uh, the bow sprit, sorry, snapped off and come foom, foom, foom past my head and took my head off and scared the crap out of me. So um, I don't know how we got that off that day, but we ended up getting it off, but Jesus, scary. Anyhow, you've got to be really careful and don't ever tie it to the back of the boat and try and pull it off. So what happens there is, and, this is, and a few boats have done this, so what happens is I think, oh, I've got a big ball out in the back corner of my, of my seven metre tinny, I'll tie it on there. And the problem is if you're not quick enough where you stall it or anything like that, which does happen sometimes, that's when you go under. So <laughs> what happens there is um, you, you've got to tie in the front. I'm not sure should be telling you how to do this because you don't want to do it. But you, a lot of guys will do is they'll um, let out about 15 metres of slack and then they'll tie it on the back corner. Then they'll drive up a bit on it and undo it off the front. 
right? And if you'll notice, Nuff said at that point, and there's, say, two knots of current, that line quickly takes up, the back swings around into the current, and the back the boat gets pulled under. Because they're not meant to be sitting the stern into the current. Does that make sense? So be really careful of that, please. Don't ever do that. It's actually, it's too dangerous. Okay. Anyhow, we'll get back to fishing. We're talking about fishing. <laughs> okay. Um, so, do we anchor up? <laughs> get back to your question. Uh, if I know the spot's really good, yes, I will. And if I know the anchor's going to hold on, I will. Um, but uh, I'd prefer to drift because if you get you get to cover more ground and backing up, backing up. It's well, if, you, if you've got a spot lock on your motor, if you've got a spot lock electric or something, or a spot lock on your helm, and there's not too much current, maybe a little bit of wind, it's fantastic. You can hold yourself in the wind and just try that spot, and then you just release and go to the next spot and try try again, you know. Um, but I'd be going to a drift first, working out where the fish are on the spot, mark it on the GPS, and then if you want to anchor, you can anchor then, but not. You need to be confident the fish are there before you throw the anchor out, because you just wasted the best time of the morning, which is when the sun's rising. Okay, and these the trouble is now it doesn't rise until like six, so you've only got a very short window to fish. They always bite early, well in in summer if they're on the bite, but in winter it's a very short bite period. Okay, Stuart, would you add to that one? No, no, okay. Yep. okay. Uh, bottom fishing. Well, actually, we might talk about Dewey's first because Dewey's in close. So, Drew fish mull away, um, great fish to catch, guys. Um, they are they are biting. We got them in the daytime last two trips out, um, but you'll get them at night time as well, um, which is better. But you need to know your you need to know swell and seaway or wherever you're going out through to come back in at night time. That's really important. Does anyone come back in the seaway at night time here? A few of you have, so you understand. Run out tide, be very careful. Preferably run in tide. So you want to fish when the moon's full, which is like next week, but not when the wind's strong like next week. But um, So you want high tide about, I don't know, 8, 9 o'clock, moon's just risen up, it's high in the sky at that time of night. And um, hopefully got a few dewies, and you come back in through the sea where high tide and, and it's fully moon lit up, it's nice. But going out on a new moon, dark night, come back in the run out tide, quite, quite tricky. You need to feel the boat. So when you're driving in the dark, you feel the boat. You don't see, you, you feel. When, and when the boat starts to fully throttle back off a bit, because you only come down a hole, that sort of thing. It's, it's all about feel. So that'll come in due course. <laughs> yeah. Okay, bottom fishing for the, for, the, uh, for the Jewies. So what we're doing is we're using exactly the same rig, but we're using the bigger rig. So we're not using the 30 pound, we're using about, um, around about sort of 60 or 80 pound leader. Okay, quite heavy leader. We're using the 7 -o hooks, which you got in your bag there, and we're using a lot bigger weight, like the biggest one that went around, probably 4 ounce or, or a size 8 ball at the smallest. The reason why, you're only fishing in like 20 to 40 metres of water, but you need to hold the bait on the bottom, because you'll run away otherwise from the fish. Fish will chase it, but it's painful because you, they run into the other lines, and you can't, you can't have four lines out when you've got light sinkers on. They all swim around each other, they'll be tangled up. You want to hold him in his position, straight down and, um, and the weight's straight on top of his head. So there's no swivel, your line's joined together with an Albright and that big sinker's sitting right on top of the two snelled hooks. And we're using snelled hooks, which Stu's gonna do right now for us, thanks Stu. And I'll put some 7 O's on there. And the circle, sort of. Some seven minutes either. I might pass them around. Did I pass the hooks around earlier, guys? No? No. no. I just told me that's sixes. Okay, sixes it is. I'll do that. That's it. Sorry, got them. Uh, so, seven o's. So, seven o's are really good because if you've got little yakkers at the moment, um, there's a lot of little yakkers and little slimies around there, like this big. And you don't want too big hooks on there because it looks a bit out of whack. So, it's very important to keep the size hook to the size of the bait using. If you're using Slime is this big, I'd be probably using nine O's. They've got big mouths on like that, so the Jewies aren't scared of the size of the hook. It's more matching the bait and looking more presentable. So we snell two hooks together. If you don't know how to snell two hooks together, just jump in our YouTube page, we'll show you how to do it, it's quite easy. Um, but you need to learn to do it, and you need to space your hooks about probably that far apart. So it's got plenty going on it, but um, once, once these pilchers are getting frosted now, Are those, uh, those rigs are down the back there somewhere, guys? Yeah, I'll send you down in a minute to grab them. We'll, 
rig it up for you. Thanks, Stuart. Oh, actually, we can just grab another one here, mate. No, I'll just knock some up. Yeah, knock some up. Yeah, we'll knock some up. But I imagine this bait's a bit bigger, okay? So what I do is the bottom hook, I know you can't see it in the back there, but if you can try and see it, I put it in that way first. I don't go through to like that. I go through to about his spine, like in depth of the flesh, and then sort of roll the hook around and then poke it out. So only um, looking from your side, only that that much of the hook sort of exposed, if that makes sense. Oh, sorry, other way around, <laughs> sorry. Um, that much the hook's exposed. Does that make sense? Like that. Is that right? I'll, I'll, send, I'll send it around so you can see it. So hold like that, put it through. It's a big hook for this little pilly though. I wouldn't use this big hook on a pilly. So just like that, okay? You can have it sideways, you don't have it sideways. I'll have that sort of that angle. And this hook here, um, with a livey, the hardest part is actually um, in here and out or through the front part. Where it's, there's one part of his, in front of his eyes is quite soft, but then just before his nostrils, there's a little hard part. You need to find that little hard part and just go straight through. Right there. I'll just pass this around. Just try not to play with it too much, guys, because the next guy's going to see it or feel it. So it's true. Didn't serve me. So this is for live bait. For live bait, yeah. So we're using live slime, is live jackets, live tail of 35 centimetres. Um, <laughs> live pike. <laughs> live pike. We're not laughing at you on the screen, then. Uh, fisheries. Um, live pike. Um, I've even caught them on uh, goat fish, whatever I can get sometimes. If I can't get live slime, it's the yakis, yakas, and I pop a little goat fish or a whatever on my, or a tail one, or whatever it is on my. Uh, like bait jig, it's going straight back down. A tar, okay. a tar one, whatever they eat, they eat tar one, they eat, they eat ludri, they eat anything actually. Yeah. But, but I generally try and obviously try and get slime with the yakas. Yeah, those little, like, fishy looking things that you get. Here, the ludri. Oh, no, 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 sweep, sweep. Sweep, is Yeah. I haven't lowered myself that far, but I'm oh, okay. <laughs> just joking. No, um, I have used sweep, but I think I've caught cobia. But they, they don't, they're very really hard to just stay alive. Yeah, they don't stay alive, because they, there, they get hemorrhage on the way up. Even oh, though it's only okay. shallow water, the yeah. eyes pop out. They're normally hooked in the eye as well, by the way. Yeah, yeah. That's sweep. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, is that a little one anyway? Okay. Stuart, do you want to do how you rig yours that way? Same, same. Same, same. Okay. Same, same. So I'll put this one through the side, guys, and then you'll see what I mean by the side. Rather than on the top, out to the top. I'm just going to scissors through. So this is for the snapper now. This is a very small pilchard. Right, just like that. Sorry. That's with a little two hook rig. Yeah. So the hook's well exposed, but it's actually through the body, the bottom hook. So yeah, so you can't see the back half hook. It's amazing how much pilchards stink when you're not fishing. <laughs> but when you're fishing, the guys come to the shop, obviously just been out fishing, and it's like, geez, you don't stink. But when you're fishing, you don't smell it, right? It's funny how it works. But the wife always smells it. <laughs> we won't go there. Okay, so um, for the Jewies, it's um, a bit heavier rig. So look, I wouldn't use, I, this is the sort of stuff I use actually, just that one there, Stu. At the massive size, something like that. <laughs> Whatever you've got in big reels, like anything around a six to six thousand or bigger, um, and braid around sort of, I wouldn't use under 40 pound, uh, 50 or 80 is good. Jewies tend to live around structure, which whether it be rocks, blocks, whatever it is on the bottom, and they know exactly how to go and break you off. Okay, so you need to pull them out. So the first, um, well, first I go to the bike period. So, um, at night time or daytime, doesn't matter. We've dropped the live down, it's hit the bottom, I've opened it up. I always point your rod at, at whatever's going out as well, so it gets down there easy and quicker. If you hold it up like that, it's got to pull it down, it's not as quick, and you get a bit of, um, you get a bit of distance in your line to the, to the boat. So try and point it at 
at where it's going down. And so it hits the bottom, click it across. The first thing before you do that actually is set your drag. Okay, and you want your drag reasonably tight on two. Now you can break hooks with too tight a drag once you get up around the sort of poundage. That can happen. It doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. Um, other than that, it's just a matter of you against him. So it hits the bottom, and I sort of like when the sort of boat goes up in the water, I drop my rod tip down, so it's nearly on the bottom the whole time. And as the, rod, as the boat goes down, I lift my rod tip up. So I'm just sort of just staying with the swell and keeping it on the bottom. And normally with the dew, you feel your livey, and all of a sudden it'll get a little bit faster on the feel. The feel will go a bit faster. And then you'll feel, it's normally dunk, dunk, bang, bang. And then the third one is boom, and that's when you boom as well. Okay, it's like dun dun bang. Every time. People say, oh, let Jewies run, let them run, let them run. Don't forget about that crap. Boom, boom, bang. You're into it. Okay? And then the tussle's on. So he's going to try and get you in wherever he's, whatever's on the structure on the bottom there. You need to hold him up just try and get as much of him off the bottom as you can. And then, it, then you fight him after that. You've just got to get him off the bottom. First three metres is probably all you need to get him up. Then you can play around with him. Um, if you're using 80 pound braid, you're going to, unless it's a metre 40 and 25 kilos, then you're in for a bit of fun. But um, 50 pound braid and a metre 10 dew, which is probably around about 12 kilos or 15 kilos, uh, 12 kilo probably, um, it's a good fight on, say, 50 pound braid. And um, when, once you get them up, maybe after about 10 minutes or, eight or five minutes, you get them to the surface. Um, they're generally stuffed at that point, and they'll lay pretty still on the side of the water. Uh, sort of belly out. Um, when you gaff one, they're slippery. So you need to have a sharp gaff and gaff it around the head area or shoulder, head or shoulder. Um, and the good thing about jewelry is they don't have teeth, they have little tiny teeth. Get the hooks out, no problems at all. Um, and, but don't drop it. If you drop one back in the water, they talk, they tell their mates. And you won't catch anything then. They're not for a while anyhow. So you've got to try and not lose one. Okay. The beauty about out here, though, we have lots of juice spots. So, of the 18 fathoms at the front, fantastic. 17 fathoms, 20 fathoms, straight up front of the seaway, and straight off the sea will do. And uh, I think some of the marks are on here. And um, you need to, uh, if you do drop one and, not, and you have another drifting, can't get a bite, and you know they're there. You can see them on the sound when they bite, they were biting. Um, just move to the next pinnacle, look for the bait, look for the, for the arches, they're generally true, and just try, try that spot and then come back to the other spot after about half an hour, and they'll probably be back on the bite again. Okay. So any questions on the jewies at all? Daytime, same scenario. Um, the only problem with dew is that nighttime is um, starting soon, the whales, whales are a problem, because you can't see them at night, and you've got to be careful driving for a start. A lot of our customers this last year yeah. hit whales and had bad dramas. Um, and the whales are getting like, Sharks, there's lots of them, lots of them. No, no drama against whales, but <laughs> you have to be careful. Um, and the other problem is, like, one time my son went to jack out jury fish at night time out the front here, and we had whales actually splash and sort of jumping out of the water right next to the boat and scaring us, but the fish were on the bite, something chronic. So we didn't leave, and then we got too scared when we did leave, and we come back again, and I hoped they'd be gone half an hour later, and they come back around again, or another pod come through, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it's pretty scary. I don't know, we've got a lot of Jewies. Um, but anyhow, that's, that's Jewies. Um, okay, then we're going to venture a bit further. So 36 fathoms, exactly the same scenario as we talked about float lining, but just a bit big, big, bigger sink as we spoke about. But now you can start using Pat and Oster rig. So you will catch snapper out in the 36s on Pat and Oster. I, I caught them on the 24s and 18s on Pat and Oster too. Um, not intentionally fishing for them, actually fishing for other stuff, um, like parrot and um, whatever and caught good snapper on there. But uh, I would say um, definitely Fisher floater and Fisher pattern oster. So the beauty of floaters is you, you've got, say, a minute and a half, two minutes to wait for it hits the bottom. You just put the rod and rod hold and bail arm open, let it fall out, right? So whilst that's happening, you then drop your, your bottom rod down and start fishing with that. And that's how, how you run two rods at once. If another one flies off, you put the other rod down. Make sure you put a rod holder so you get ripped out of the boat, maybe. Um, and then, um, to make sure the motor's not reverse, by the way, because <laughs> no, this line's going to get caught around there because you're not watching it, and grab your floater and you're onto the, uh, the snapper there. So it's all about doing that. But um, 
Otherwise, you fish two floaters at once in that depth of water because they take a while to get down, like I was saying. So two guys, four, four rods out, four floaters out. Um, otherwise, one bottom, one, one floater. So pattern osterig, look, um, you can get stuff that's made up, pre-made. These We sell lots and lots and lots of these. Um, there's a, has anyone used this, these things before? Dress hooks, sort of thing? Circles? Yeah, I'll pass it around. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'll grab one out and then I'll... Actually, I think I've got one out in here, too. Yeah, I have. I'll pass the box around. I'll pass the real one around. Um, I'll undo it, though. So these things really work. Again, it's got all the fluffy stuff on there. Um, does it make a difference? Yes, it does in a Pat Noster, 100%. They first came out years ago um, with the Black Magic Snapper Snatchers and a couple other brands um, with a little bit of like flash on there, but now they've got skirts and t silicon legs and whatever else, and they work really well. So these fellows here, um, you've got a, a little loop on the bottom, which is actually useless for putting on a, a snapper leg because it won't go through that little loop. So um, in that case, you're better off actually just making another loop, a bigger loop. So it's a little bit tight. So just do like a, a little hitch over like so. Probably better if you put glasses on if you're old like me. Pull it off like that, that's your loop. Cut that other one off with the scissors too. Don't want any extra on there. So then put on, so on the, on the 24, so let's say it's four. If you want to fish a pattern on the 24 patterns, eight ounces is the best size on the 24 pattern. Loop. If you want to fish light, on there, it fishes four ounces. That's as light as you'll go. Oops. On the 36 fathom reef, which is 60 metres, 65, 70 metres, uh, 12 or a 16, but 12 preferably. Eight's going to be a little bit light. You want to keep this away from your, um, your float line. So swivel on the top, which ties to your line or your snap swivel or whatever. And you've got these two dressed hooks on here. So what do you put on there? So half pilly and squid. So a great thing which I do, whether it be for snapper or for pearlies or for flame snapper or whatever, um, I always use the, the head half of the pilly, cut the pilly in half, put it through the eye of the, um, of the pilly, straight, straight through, and it just dangles on there loose. And then I put a piece of squid on the end. And the squid holds the pilly on and the pilly becomes the burly, they bite on it, stuff goes everywhere, they come back and grab it hard. And the same on the bottom down there as well. Is that a bit close to the bottom? Look, if you've got wire weed, it will get maybe caught up. Um, but for just general fishing, um, it's, you know, getting caught on the bottom is always a problem with this, but it's normally that that gets caught, not the hook. So you're drifting doing that? Drifting doing that. But also, but also at anchor too. Same deal. Yeah. yeah, so at anchor, when they're on the bite, like when they come on the bite, let's say it's bite time and you're just getting smacking it and you are at anchor, um, just um, straight down with this. There'll only be smaller squire, the odd bigger one, yeah. but you'll get the numbers. But you can only get, what's it, four each? Yeah. yeah. Eight. Have you used breakaway sinkers? Sorry. No, because they're too dear. <laughs> I'd rather sink it back. Good question, though. Um, look, my dad used to do all that, but in the old days, I think that was cheaper back in those days. Um, but no, I try and get it back. So on this, I'm using 50 pound braid, not 30, at least. and. It's fairly, it's fairly hard to break 50 pound braid, so you can generally try and get it off. Sometimes you have to lock the drag up, hold your hand on the spool, and just use the boat to come up the swell to pop it. Always point the rod at it. Don't try and get with it and break it. You'll break the rod traps. Have you, have you found line? Uh, this is fluorocarbon, actually. Um, on this particular rig, I was going around. Um, I think it's 50 or 60. Yeah, this is, yeah. The, this is the heavy one, which we use out in the 50 fathom rig. Yeah. It's seven O's. Um, it's 80 main and 50 branch. I think that, yeah. Which is, we use that aid on the flames as well. Yes. There's plenty. I'll pass that around. Thank you, Stuart. But remember, that's normally a bit longer, but I cut off that much of it and tied it up, sort of thing. So, yeah, it's a little bit short. You can tie a bit of line, mate, if, a lighter line, to that loop that was originally on the bottom. So it's about that far below the hook. And tie a bit long, more on there if you wanted to. 30 pound, if you're going to have a breakaway and make a loop in it and put your sink on it. That'll also, work as well. Yeah, you do get a bit dragging yeah. through the rocks and stuff. Correct, yeah. mate, yeah. Um, on the hook part, though, it shouldn't be too bad, but no, always just check it, always check it. Yeah, you do. 
Yeah, so check that, because obviously there's sharp things down there too. Mm. Yeah. But to make one up, um, this is what you should learn to do. Sorry guys, put my dirty glasses on. That's it. So yeah, so, uh, probably about here something. So I like to have three hooks on, and sometimes with those, two, those rigs going around, I, I cut off the bottom little loop and I tie it onto the other end of the swivel, and I've got four. So it's four, right? And they're fairly well priced, those things. Um, but to make the bottom loop again, all you do is I said before, just like so, do a half hitch like so, go through there twice if you want, once is probably enough. Pull it off like so, that becomes your sinker one. And we cut that off. Even though it's a sinker and it is pretty important to cut that tag off because if it does overrun it or anything like that, mm. that little tag end just catches everything. Gets caught yeah. in everything, yeah. As you say, mate, come up a bit higher. Come up around about sort of that high up and then make your loop. Actually, come down a bit because you've got much lining. Like so. And then just do your, your little um, dropper loop, which is around, 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 around. For guys down the back, just jump on YouTube and you'll see it on our YouTube page. Pull it up evenly, like so. You should wet it and then just squeeze it tight, and it just hangs nice and neat to the side. How many people can do that? Uh, about, uh, about... Probably six or eight. Six or eight, I'll yeah. tell you. One, two, <laughs> three, four, five, six. Yeah, six is enough. Pull it through. Well, you can have a heap of these made up too, like so. Another one right at the top here. Yeah, that's fast, yeah, very fast. Okay, then we're going to tie a swivel to the top here. So swivel size, generally about a size two or one crane. Um, it just seems to work better. A couple of beers with your mates and have a rigging up day. Get some uh, pool noodle and wrap them around the pool noodle. And cut off pieces about that long and uh, put them into, if you want to make it really neat, buy like a big plastic tub like, with a lid on. Not a big plastic one, probably the size of two loaves of bread. And um, have sort of four, four or five of these um, pool noodle pieces in there with, the, with about probably six rigs on each. And that's enough to do for the whole year. Is there a reason why you use the swivel rather than a knot? Uh, because it, it eliminates the twist, it helps to eliminate the twist, yeah. Yeah, and then the next thing I do is put on glow beads, like power them out. You don't always have a lot of twist when you sink in these, like you will a little bit because you've got bait and stuff like that, it'll spin a bit, but it's more when fish are coming up. Especially yeah. pearlies, they've got, like, they, they got like propellers on the side of them, those blades stick out in their mouth, opens up and they, just, and they cut your line too. Really. So just put on some glow beads, let's quickly make a rig so you know how it works. Pull it up. Is everything you're saying about snapper, do you just do exactly the same thing for fairly? Uh, exactly the same. Exactly the same. Is it's just different country that we no, different spots. Yeah, a little right. bit different. You still catch pearlies with snapper, but there was little ones. With the odd big one, but not many. Okay, so now we're going to put on, um, oh, we passed away and got double hooks in there. <laughs> uh, and the dress hooks. Um, so we did want to get the dress hooks and double hooks. Right? Oh, you're right, Chris. She'll go over the back. They're the, um, they're the dress hooks here. The yeah, gangs. They're the gang hooks here. That's all good, mate. All good. Right. Yeah, all good. So what I do, guys, in the middle hooks, um, I'll run some, um, some circle hooks. You've got seven O circles here. So now we're fishing for, say, pearlies. And I'll talk about pearlies in a minute, but fishing oh, yeah, for a bit right. bigger fish. With a chance, so when you're fishing out deep water, especially beyond 60 metres, there's a good chance you're going to get a cobia or a... An amberjack or a Samson or a Kingy. And um, yeah, it's all um, completely different to what you're going to get in, in close. In close, you still get odd good fish, but you don't get big lots. Oh, wrong one, sorry. So I'll, I'll probably actually do one of these too. So on the top here, you can do like Stu's got here, double hook, or you can put a, um, a dress hook. I like to use a dress hook. Sorry. Where's 
when you put a circle hook on, put it on facing with the hook tip facing you. So don't go from behind that way. Don't go through that way. Go through that way. A pro taught me that. Does it work better? I don't know, I've always done it that way. <laughs> it seems to work for me. Because it's meant to be when they bite on it, even though it's sitting that way, um, it, it just hooks better. It hooks in much better than facing out. Try it. So um, you can push the little bead over some of these hooks and it actually goes over the top, not that one though. Um, but I just have it sitting on there, like so. If you want, you can use skirts as well, but we've got skirts on the top gang hook, so it's cool. Stewie's pulling it through here now. So I'll pass this around. So the bait system is going to be pilchard or a slimy or a strip bait on the top gang hook, and then squid and pilly or squid only on the next two hooks. And then your uh, 16 ounce or 12 ounce snapper leads on the bottom. <coughs> and just pull through. And that's it, just like that. So that's down on the bottom there, and that's it. So gang hook there with whatever on it, and squid and pilly, squid and pilly down there. Does everyone do that sort of rig? You probably do. But don't use two hooks, use three. Four. <laughs> Six. <laughs> I only do that in the deep waters occasionally. Yeah. Uh, around about uh, 50 centimetres. Yeah. yeah. I'd rather have the rig a bit longer than too short. Yeah. Some people like to have it short. I had Mr Fisher, the mate of mine, and he was very tight on everything. So even the measurement of the line between the hook and the swivel, our sinker and the swivel was, had to be short so he didn't use too much line. And he's, <laughs> I won't say his name. And his distance of his droppers was very short and they were about that far apart from each other. So when, he, when the fish are on, he'd pull up three... When it first came up, like I've got a freaking massive fish on, but they'd be three snapper or three pearl is that size, all slapping each other in the head in a row. Because that's where his three or four hooks were in that little area like that. You know? So, it worked. It worked. But I like to keep it spaced apart. I grab my fish one at a time and pull them in the boat. Yeah, so it's a bit messed up there, guys, but just throw it around. Yes, it's hanging off already? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's the bottom and people are cram over. That's all good, guys. I say, uh, yeah, correct. Um, I believe that if you've got one fish comes along and, and it's in the area and it grabs the bait, right, and you then wind him up, um, you haven't had a chance for his mates to come in, especially the big bad guy. If you've got multiple hooks on there, three or whatever, um, and you hook that first fish, if it's only a little, if it's a big one, it comes straight up. I don't, I don't wait for a second one. But if it's a little one, I hold it there. I hold the rod tip up, so it's it's just on the bottom, just off the bottom. But I'm keeping the keeping the hook. Could be not too bad a size fish, but he's going to start spewing out stuff, and he's going to make the whatever noise. So hopefully sharks don't get him. And his mates are going to come hooking in. That's how I believe it works. And they then will attack the other baits. And then when fish stick up, um, their mates will come around. And that's how it all works. And they get a bit frantically and they just bite hard. And you'll always find if you've got one fish on the line, the second bite's really quick, it's an instantaneous, straight away, straight away, straight away. But if you just pull that one fish up, and you, you never know, right? And you drop back down and you get another one. But you can't, you, you've got to remember your bag limit, right? <laughs> so you can't go having too much fun. So pearlies are a classic example. Sometimes in the pearlies, and when they're loaded on and biting, and they're good size, um, you can get three on your four hook dropper rig at a time. You're only allowed four per person. So if you've got two guys in the boat, you know, one one drift you can be bagged out. So then you're gonna go chase snapper. So but the thing is with pearlies is to get the better pearlies. Um, they're they're all in close, they're everywhere, but the multiple numbers are out in the deeper water. And you don't get many snapper there, you get pearlies and pearlies, or kings and stuff with them. Um, so you go target something else. You come in a bit closer and target snapper. So it depends on the weather. So the weather forecast is, say, um, <coughs> say you got a westerly in the morning of 15 knots, it's going to drop out to 8 or 10 knots during the day. Then I like to chase snapper in close early. Because uh, you don't want to get out to 15 knots out in the 50s, it's too ugly. 
So then as the day gets better, then you go chase your pearly scent. But if you've got a day where it's five knots in the morning, it's going to come up 15 to 20 at, in, at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I'd be burned straight out wide if, it might, if, if I want to do this. And I'd fish for pearlies first, and then I'd work my way back in as the wind come in. The subtleties change, come through, whatever. It's all relative to the wind direction to what you're going to chase. Is that all right? Does that make sense? What do you so you plan your day. Uh, 50 fathoms. 50. Yeah, or a bit deeper. Okay. Yeah. So just remember the bottom shape like, like that. That's the shoreline. And that's 100 metres. It's very slow, especially 80 metres. 80 metres goes for about 10 k's. It doesn't change. It's, you think you're on 50 fathoms, you hit 80 metres, but you're not there yet. You're at the start of it. So it's about, at about probably 28 k's out is the start of 80 metres. And then for the next 12 k's, it's still 80 metres. <laughs> and then when you get to around 85 to 90 metres, the bottom then changes um, into, into that angle. That's the edge of our coast. That's the continental shelf. Or it's not from the shelf, but it's the, it's the drop off. And everywhere in Australia, it's always at 100 metres in most places. Okay? So it goes like that, and then it goes like that. So to go from 100 metres to 150 metres, you only go, that's 40 k's, you've only gone about probably 4 k's, or not even 3 k's, and you've just done half the de depth again, you know, 150 metres. So when you're at the 50 fathom reef, uh, and it's, it's nice weather, you don't need to be, everyone thinks it's another 10 k out to get to 120 metres or something, it's not, it's just, you see the boats, they're just 1.2 k's away, or 2 k's away. So just go out a little bit further. And that's where your big pearlies are, that's where your a lot of amberjacks out there, kings, uh, snapper. Everything's the same, but just bigger and more multiples of them because they're not hammered. Everyone stays just two k's that way of you. And that's as far as they go. Has anyone done that sort of 100, 120 metre mark? Yes. A couple of you? Yeah. yeah. And have res good results? Always. Always, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, totally right, Glenn, that's right. So. It's, um, it's the difference between getting a good catch and getting a really good catch, <laughs> okay? And don't be scared to have a look. But the thing is, though, the bottom structure is not as dominant as it is in close. So we've got my pinnacles in close here that are eight metres, 36 fathoms, 10 metres up north, there's even 12 metres. But, and on the 50s, the deepest ones on the western side is probably about an eight metre wall. That's about as, as abrupt as it's gonna be. Then once you go over 100 metres, um, it's only like in the at the hundreds of 200 metres, it might be a lump that comes up two metres maybe. It's only about a metre. And it's wire weed, so it's a rubble bottom and that coily wire weed stuff, which we had some here somewhere. I don't know what that is now, Stuart. <laughs> it's gone. Uh, it's like a coal spring, and that's what the fish hang on, especially pearlies. And it, it, and it grows to the little pebbles and grows up with it. So you only see the wire weed, you don't even see much of the bottom front, uh, come up. It's just like it goes buzzy on the bottom. And that's what you're looking for. So if you wanted to go exploring, look between 90 and 120 metres or 125, which is about 2K, and just zigzag heading north or south on that depth, and you'll find stuff. And make sure your window's zoomed into probably 20 metre window on the bottom, and you look at the bottom 20 metres. And probably maybe switch, if you haven't got a really good sounder, Switch to 50 kilohertz or 83 kilohertz, depends how old your sounder is. And uh, you'll pick the bottom up much clearer and, and more definition, and it's more of a narrow beam, and more power emphasised in that area, and you'll see a lot clearer picture. Where if you're on 200 and it's a little bit rough especially, you get lots of hits and misses in, in your picture, and it's too wide, okay? So change your setting. Um, if you've got chirp or one kilowatt, you, you'll fry the fish, you'll, you'll see everything. Any questions on that at all? We'll talk. Oh, if you've got one kilowatt <laughs> sounder, I like to uh, transducer, uh, you'll be able to see everything. At that, doing that, doing 25 knots <laughs> in that depth. The pitch will be perfect. Should what, be perfect. What about chirp? Chirp's good too. So chirp, you can actually dial in to get it right. So it depends on, the, on many things, on the water, water um, what do you call that? Clatter Column? Layering. Yeah, clutter. Yeah. yeah, that's it, clutter. Yeah. Clutter and uh, the layer of the. Um, I don't know, bloody name. Scatter, like scatter layer. 
So that can change the power to get down to the bottom. Take up, well, I can absorb it a bit, and it won't be as good a picture. But um, but if you got chirp, you can sort of like play around the different frequencies to get it right to nail it. Yeah. And most bass these days have chirp on them. My sound is sorry. Yeah. Okay, so that's our bottom dropper rig. Um, now with bottom dropper rigs, you have to reverse up, unless you got no wind and no current. A little bit of current's okay. But if your line's vertical, that's fine. And the other day we were out there and we hardly backed up at all because if you back up into current um, just to keep your line straight, it becomes all, all a skid whiff. It's very hard to get it to be straight. You're better off not backing up and just drifting at three knots, zooming down with the current when, when it's a glass out, right? Um, but when you've got not too much current but a lot of wind, you need to learn to reverse. And, the, and to keep it reversed, your line needs to be, you don't want it tied at the back like, I know you can't see it down the back, I'll show you the picture actually. Oops, if that's your boat, like that, and this is your rods here, you don't want your line to be like, like that angle, down the bottom, it's just too hard, okay? So with your motor on the back here, you need to reverse up, take up the slack as you're reversing up, so the boat's sitting now, I'll take the picture that way. Your, your line's now like down that angle there, or even that angle there, in this, in this area here is where you want it. Halfway down the boat to halfway the boat length back up, sort of thing, in that area. So you just gotta keep backing up and backing up and backing up and backing up until the lines even go past the boat a bit, and that's when you get the bite straight away. As soon as you get that slack in the line, that bit of belly, um, the fishing's straight on. So, I so said before, you fill the bites, you hook up, you hold the right up a little bit so it's keep that one taut, and get the second one on, and that's how you do it on a Pat Noster rig. So you wouldn't cast upstream and try and let it come down? No, because you get too much belly in your line. I do, I do with the floater one though, um, but... Uh, it's quite hard to yeah. throw like a long rig as yeah. well. They tumble in the air. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, don't try and throw your Pat Noster. Sometimes if, no. I, if I got, if my boat's got three or four guys fishing off it, yeah, I'll flick it away from them, and, but always up current, of course, never out the back that way, um, and do that. But it's really good if you got the two guys at the back to drop their lines first. They say got four guys in the boat. The two guys at the back to drop their lines first, the two guys fishing up a bit front next to them to drop theirs after those guys about halfway down. And then at that point, when they're near the bottom, you reverse up just a little bit to bring their lines back in line. And by that time, the other guys are just about nearly hit the bottom. And those guys should be ready getting bites, so the next minute you're getting bites. Yeah. And it's good because they hold the fish there for your lines to land right next to them. Yeah. And then they start coming up. That's the perfect scenario. Yeah. Um, but if you all drop at the same time, you could get a few problems. Yeah. If you've got two of you, though, that's cool because it's inside the boat. Yeah. How many guys do you fish like more than two guys on the boat? A few of you do, yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Rick, you're cool, you've got a big boat, so that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Drifting dove, yes. do you recommend uh, sea anchor? Uh, yeah, so sea anchor, good question. Um, look, I used to use sea anchor a lot when I was a, bit, a while ago. Um, I don't mind using them, but I prefer to, I guess I got used to driving up backwards all the time now. Uh, but there is a time and place for them, especially in really windy days, so they're just, it's sometimes dangerous to reverse into swell and whatever. And so, especially if you've got wind against current, so they're quite steep ways, right? And I've had a few fill the back of the boat up and scare the crap out of me. Um, but uh, the sea anchor is uh, sometimes, especially if you're excited, you forget about it and you can rip it, run over it, whatever it might be. Because um, you just got hits of fish in the boat, they're all in the high five and, and then you start the motor or the motor restart and you just rip off, oh shit, the sea anchor's just got around my prop or whatever. Um, but if you're going to do it, um, I suggest running it probably on, the, I always run mine on the starboard side back quarter. Uh, that's a good question too. Around about probably eight to 10 metres. You can't use a, you can't float line fish with a sea anchor though, I find. You can bottom fish with a Pat Noster, but it's very hard to float line because it just gets around the road, it gets in the water too much. Unless you've got not too much wind, but then you wouldn't use a sea anchor, so. Um, but they're really good. Um, I'd, I'd definitely suggest everyone have a sea anchor on the boat. So it's just like a parachute type thing on rope and, and a spin so it doesn't get caught up, whatever. 
Um, the problem is, is just you've got to deploy it and pull it back in again. But definitely slows your drift down by half, mate. At least half. Um, if you've got an electric motor, that's even good too. But you don't want them in out of uh, rough water. They're hard to use because they're in out of the water a lot, right? On big boats. They're not made long enough. Although I hear, um, I think Garmin is bringing out a 108 inch one. Or yeah, real long inch. one. Yeah. Eight foot long. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to deploy that on a, I mounted on the front of the boat, it's going to be a bit hard, especially on a 15 foot boat if you've got a big. <laughs> but, um, but it'll definitely hold it in most spots. But I think they're made for boats around 10 metres in length. Yeah, like cats and stuff like that. Because yeah. they're so high in the nose, you need that longer shaft. Mm. To mm. That generally uh, gives the electric just a heading lock into the wind. Yeah, correct. Just, just put it on two or three, just, yeah, just, just, just enough just by the wind. That way you, you yeah. watch your lines yeah. and you just increase your speed until your uh, uh, lines are straight down. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. That, that seems to work really good. And that way you're always facing into the wind as well. Yeah. 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 Same, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way of doing it. I, I, was, I had an E-Tech for 225 and on my old boat, my old Haynes, and it could sit in idle and reverse at about less than one knot. So it was just ticking away. Mm. And if you got caught in the prop, it wasn't too bad because it, it was like slow motion, so you can unravel it. <laughs> Um, with the other boats, like, so um, it was perfect. But um, my other boats can't tick that slow. Um, so it depends. It's all about understanding your boat and the, on the day on, as well. Okay, so um, we talked about the deeper water. So you're catching uh, on the snapper ground. So in that sort of 50 fathom reef, which is around 85 to 90 meters, um, we're catching snapper, pearlies, kingfish, amberjack, and all, all above parrotfish cod, whatever. Um, and then the next level is to go out to that, we talk about 400 to 120 metres or 90 to 125 metres. Um, we're going to catch bigger pearlies, uh, snapper, um, amberjacks more than kingies actually. Get kingies there too, but more amberjacks for some reason. Um, and uh, we get other things, we get like uh, a lot more pigfish. You know, pigfish are the very nice to eat, black spot pigfish. The, the red sort of ones like coral trout sort of looking thing. Um, and we get nanogai, we get small barcode. It all ramps up a little bit onto different species categories um, to what you get uh, in closer. And then you'll get also, um, uh, if you get a pearly on, you get try to get the second one on, you get a lot of big cod, a lot of big barcode in that grounds too, or uh, even odd estuary cod, but more, more of deep water cod. And they'll eat the pearly whole while you're holding, trying to get the second one on. All of a sudden, they go, What's this? And if you get one up, they're always around that sort of 30 kilo plus. Yeah. Sometimes they get the fish stuck in their head, in their mouth. Yeah. So, um, so that's an alternative. Sharks are a problem though, and it doesn't matter if you're fishing in um, 25 meters deep or fishing in 125 meters deep. Sharks are a problem. Can't do much about that um, except maybe move. You, know, you can't. I'll follow your boat too, so I just suggest going fast. It's true, <laughs> true. They'll do, if you move it at, uh, say, 15 knots and go 2 k's, they hone in on you. They'll hear the motor. Even You might have got away from them, but they'll hear it and they'll, they'll come up to you. They're getting so clever. Um, and, uh, but anyhow, that's, that's the bottom fishing scene for, for out there. But um, how many guys here got boats under 4.5? Okay, and do you guys fish, how deep do you fish out to? Who fishes out to... Say the diamond reef, 24s. Yep, and 36s. Want to go to 36s, maybe? Not really. Okay, so the diamond reef is we talked about earlier. Um, my biggest snapper in oh, my biggest snapper off, off half a point lookout, but um, but in close here, close to the same size, have been just out of the 18 fathoms here, bigger than I can ever caught out the 50s or 36s or anywhere, and in numbers, not just one, but catch. Four or five at a time that are all in the 90s or more meter maybe and in the high like sort of 14 kilos close to 30 pounds big ones so 18 fathoms is a great spot and it fishes produces every year okay um, the last time i've seen big numbers there was probably about six years ago maybe but um but in as a catch like two or three at a time that size Do you, is there a lot of structure on the 18? Yeah, there's heaps, and um, the ones on. I'll just quickly this one real quickly now. Um, 
So the 27, I put this one specifically on there for you guys. So 2756, there's three numbers there. Oh, there's actually a few, but the first three, which is number three, four, and five on that list under 50 metres, where it says 2756 and 153.28. So 153.28 is 18 fathoms. And 29 is sort of 18 to 19 fathoms, uh, or 20 fathoms. So um, those three marks, which is number three, four, and five, um, are all different pinnacles on the 18 sort of from off, uh, say, um, to south of Pump and Jetty to about SeaWorld. Okay? And that's where I caught my biggest snapper. I don't mind sharing with you guys because it's only there. You get the dewy there as well? get dewy there as well, correct. And you get lots of mackerel there right now as we speak. <laughs> yeah. You can count on the dewy spots as well. Yeah, they're, they're dewy spots as well. Oh, for the dewy <laughs> seminar. That's right. It's the same, same. Yeah. <laughs> So the, you'll get both there. Um, I will quickly do the marks over here anyhow. So the 2757 mark, um, that's a bit further south. So that's about off um, SeaWorld, and it's a little bit deep. It's in about 22,000 steep. 2756, um, that's the top end of the diamond ring. So the 2756, 153, is the top end of the diamond ring. It's the northern end. That's a really good snap area, guys. So, I don't know if you guys have fished that. So you're off sort of a um, little bit. It's the same parallels as the Seaway, 2756. But they don't, our, our um, parallel lines are the ones that run crossways. Don't run dead straight, looking straight. They actually run southeast. So what's 2756 off the Seaway is actually, if you're out, say, on 50 fathoms, you're about off sort of, I don't know, main beach. So you've gone like three or four k south. That's because on the angle that it's on. Does that make sense? So as you go deeper, uh, it's a bit different. Um, so all those 58, 2758, that's off about sort of um, Main Beach, or maybe even a bit further south off um, Focus area. And 2759, you're about off um, Broad Beach, and 2800, you're sort of off Q1 or Broad Beach area, I guess, yeah. So they're all obtainable for you guys in the smaller boats and, um, and really good fishing spots over the next three months. And you will get pearlies at some of those spots. Um, there's a few good pearl perch. Anyone caught a good pearl perch in close this year at all? Any of you guys have? But a lot of our customers have, that's true. Mm, yeah. Like 50 to 55 centimetre ones, like three or four kilos, in right in just on 18, 20 pound reefs. Uh, not many, one or two. Okay. Um, so the under 70 metre ones, um, we start right up north. So we're at 2738. If you look on the chart, is it, which is a bad with the strip above? Is that 13? It's um, three. It's no. about three. Yeah, 11, Chris, that's re 14. 14, is it? 14, yes. Okay, 14, thank you, Chris. Yeah. I know Chris fishes there a fair bit. So that's FAD 14 area. So it's northeast of the jumping pin bar, 36 fathoms northeast of jumping pin. That's the one that comes right up. It comes up from 66 metres up to about 56 or 54. It comes up like 10 or 12 metres. It's probably the biggest rise we've got off the Gold Coast in, in close, in, in 100 metres. Um, and then that 2740 is actually the southern end of it. So it's about a mile long. It's quite a big reef. And then the fad's right there at, at that, uh, that area. Now, when you get to the 36s, um, particularly northeast area, it has two ridges that run parallel, nearly like train tracks. Um, so, that's jumping pin bar there. Australia and North Strati. And that's the seaway there. Burley, Tweed Heads. So the 36 is up this end of town. That one I've said before, it's like about there sort of thing. So just north of Jumping Pin. And then there's another ridge. This is sort of scattered through here, which are the marks here that are sort of that 2746 area. And then once we get to about 48, um, we get like a line that runs like that and another one here exactly one mile away 
at runs like that with a couple of little breaks in between the sand patches, might be a K or two Ks long, in between. And that one there is on 153.36, and that one there is 153.37. So that's one nautical mile, six to seven is one nautical mile. So you'll see there's marks on there from 27.48 all the way down to 27.52 that are either 36 or 37. And there's similar area opposite each other sort of all the way down. And um, they're my good spots where I get a really big snap are. Uh, ben Smith's been fishing a lot around that area at the moment as well. Um, and a few other customers. Steve, oh, I can't remember Steve, Steve Vince. Steve and Vince, we get a lot there as well in that area. Um, but guys, what it is, um, you need to work out whether sometimes the fish are on the inside ledge and sometimes on the outside ledge. Which one you hit first is up to you. You hit the close one or the wide one. Hit and miss. You've only got half an hour of really full on biting period as that sun pops its head up. Then after that, you can play around then. But you've got to choose which one to go to first because by the time you try that one spot and they're not there, or there might be a few little ones there. They could be biting their heads off on the inside ledge and not the outside ledge. Well, you're not seeing a lot on your sand, are they? Yeah, you will. You'll see them, but they may not be biting. They, te they tend to be biting either one or the other and not on both at the same time, ever. And it's just a matter of quickly trying. If you've got two boats, it's good. So one go there, one go there. The yes. <laughs> Give these lots a go. Um, but, guys, if you've got um, two boats that work together and both go to different, the different depth, and the depth's similar actually, but the, the ridges are apart. One goes there, one goes there, um, and they call each other up who's ever getting the fish. But I'm pretty well bet most times it'll be one or the other, it won't be both you getting the fish at the same time. You get little fish, but you won't get the big ones. They'll be there or there. Before the uh, period increases, weight, increases Yeah, it does. So this, unfortunately, the weather's coming bad now, but this weekend's a really good bite time, as in uh, high tides right on daylight which is a good thing, that's a real good bite. Um, and then two hours later, sort of eight to 10 o'clock is a good time still in the morning to fish. So it was two hours after high is the start of the good bite time. And it goes for about two hours. So it'll finish about two hours before low. And then at low, you get the minor bite yeah, at the start of the run in. The further in you go, the deeper you get, does that make any difference? It 100%. It doesn't matter if it's in the dam, in, in Hins Dam or 500 metres, it's the same. <laughs> I don't know how it works, mate, but it just works, yeah. It's, even the dams, it works, even though they're not tidal. But it's a lot to do with the moon rising as well. So the moon's rising, uh, it's, com it's uh, coming up later in the day now. So last two, uh, 10 days ago when there was a good bike period again, um, the moon was in the dark moon, it's in the sky all day. So it would have been coming up in the morning and then it sort of might be a little slither of moon, but it'd be in the sky most of the day, then it sets before sunset. So that's when you get a good bite period for a while. Um, and then now it's rising uh, probably around about, I'm guessing about uh, one in the, or two in the afternoon tomorrow maybe, or one in the afternoon, and we'll set it one tomorrow, the next morning. So you'll get a night bite, afternoon night bite. Yeah. So for the Jewies, earlier was speaking, if you've got that uh, full moon rising just after dark or just on dark, which is normally kind of size with the tide. Yeah, so there's two apps. Uh, Fishing Reminder is not too bad. Fishing, Remi Fishing Reminder, it's called. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, and uh, Windy's pretty good. It'll give you an idea as well. But you need to go to Windy Pro, I think, to see what I'm. Uh, windy, windy, yeah. windy App, sorry, not Windy. Not Windy.com, Windy App, is that right, Chris? Yeah, we've worked this out together. <laughs> so, <laughs> so windy app. There's two different windies. One's blue, one's red. Go the blue one. Is that right? That's right. Don't go the red one. Don't go the red one. Yeah. So um, that'll show you as well. And then there's like the little Alamac books and stuff like that that the Islanders use that are carried around there as well. Yep. So there's a moon bite. There's a tide bite. There's an early afternoon bite. Early morning, early afternoon, or evening. I think the windy app goes off the barometer as well. It does, yeah. So barometer is so important. So yesterday, um, the day before yesterday, it was 1,020. 1,020 was the barometer. Fish are biting good. 
yesterday for some reason, I mean, it's a bit of a low falling out here. Um, it dropped to 1,014. And uh, we fished, I went out on double on point charter boat yesterday, off double on point, we went out uh, 50 miles, so 100 k's out, right up near, off bloody near Indian Head, but out in the deep. And um, it was terrible, it was really windy for a start, but um, the uh, barometer dropped and they just did not bite. So Greg Pierce, who's a really good skipper, and it's a really good charter boat if you want to go for a charter, that's the one to go on. Uh, it's called Double on Point Fishing Charters, I think. Um, he tried so hard <laughs> and he was frustrated because he couldn't work out why they didn't bite. We, couldn't, we can't get uh, um, any uh, coverage at this. They don't know what the barometer's dropped, you know. And then yeah, when we got back, it dropped in the morning early, 1014, dropped six points. And they don't, the fish just don't like it. Not a sudden drop like that too, by the way. If it went up down to maybe 1018, they probably still bit all right. We got a few places they bit in the afternoon, it must have started to rise a bit again. Then today it was up a bit more, 1017 or 16. They bit a bit better today outside here. They're probably the same up there too, but it was windy up there today as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's very important. It's, it's, just, it's not just a matter of just going out there, dropping the line down, you know, we teach all this and hope you catch fish. You've still got to take into account all those things as well. But it's the difference between, you know how they say 90% of the fishermen don't catch fish and 10% do? The 10% study all of that stuff and they put it into their, their day out. So, you know, and it's, it's hard when you only get one day off a month or two days off a month where the weather coincides so nice and you're keen to go, but if you're a real one of those ten percent, and look at the everything, all the all the stars, and, and they're all bad, and it's blowing five knots, you go take the kids to the pictures or something, <laughs> and and just think why. Um, but the way the ninety percent will probably go, and they might catch a few fish. Don't get me wrong, but you won't catch the fish you would. So when the weather's next time around. And the weather comes good, and you got your day off, and everything lines up. That's the day you smash it. They bite all day, or most of the day. Okay. Unfortunately, the weather's not on our side. <laughs> it's, it's, this is the first time I've seen a few days of good weather. This, this probably last six months. It's been one day here, one day there, right? That's very frustrating. Yeah. Um, okay, so kings and amberjacks. If you want to catch kings and amberjacks on live baits, and I'm talking cobia in close as well for the guys with smaller boats. Um, you get bigger cobia in close than you do out wide. So all the big cobia, 30 kilo plus, are all caught within 50 metres deep. Once you get out to 36 fathoms or 50 fathoms, you might get the odd 20 kilo one, but you won't get much over 20, they'll be about 10 kilo. Don't know why that is. Um, one reason is that the whales don't, you don't see as many whales out in 100 metres as you do in 50 metres. And all those big cobia swim with the whales, that's how they all rock up here soon. So um, all you do is you fish exactly the same way as you do with, with the jewies. But you might drop your sinker a little bit, bit down. So if I'm specifically going for cobia, I'll have one under a balloon, I'll have one with a one ounce sinker on it, sort of frolicking around everywhere, and I have one with a big lead on it stuck down there. And try use big baits. If you want to get big fish, big baits. So legal tailor, um, biggest slime as you can get, uh, or whatever you can get, just throw it out. Okay, and you need big gear. You need at least that sort of 50 pound minimum, 80 pound preferably. And cobia, you can tell straight away it's a cobia, especially hook on the bottom. It'll pull really, really hard, and then within about 10 minutes in the fight, it'll come to the top. Now a lot of guys think the sharks are cobia, and I think even my younger day I might have cut one or two off, thinking they were sharks, bloody sharks. And then the cobia have a bad habit. Has anyone ever cut off a cobia thing on the shark yet? Anyone here? When you do, if you ever do do that, don't, don't do it. But if you ever do do it, they always come up and have a, they, they give you a better look at them and show they are cobia. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that is, but they do. Rub it in. Yeah, rub it in perhaps. <laughs> oh, it was a cobia. Okay. Anyhow, but um, yeah, so they'll come to the top and then they'll go back down again. But cobia are very strong and very hard in the head and very hard to gaff and they roll. So most cobia are lost not fighting it, but at the boat, trying to gaff it. Many cobia are swimming around at the moment with gas in them, because they rip it out of your hand, they roll. And they're really chunky and they're really hard. And big cobia, I think get 50 kilo ones heavy, coming out in the next three months. So my suggestion is fish heavy, 80 pound braid, preferably. 
uh, 100, 120 pound leader, and at least 90, 80 to 10 hooks. Are the bigger caveat, you know, caveat, are they as good at eating as a small one? Yeah, I, probably the biggest, I haven't got a 50 kilo one yet, haven't landed one yet, I should say. Um, but my customers have, some customers have. Um, yeah, they, they taste good, taste really good. Kobe is one of those fish that doesn't seem to change its flesh, whether it be a little fish or a big one, they're the same taste. No, I've never seen a cobra with cigateria in it. But if you have had cigateria, like Stuart, and you get any fish with just a little taint of cigateria in it, it'll come in you. It'll add to the list because it stays in your body. Is that right, Stuart? Mm. Sorry, Stuart. Yeah, That's forever. Yeah. Forever. Yeah, compounds. Your body can't get rid of it. It's like mercury poisoning. Yeah. Has anyone had cigateria poisoning here at all? How'd yeah, you go, yeah, mate? Yeah, yeah. You'll know about it. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. You'll know. Do you, Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. So, I think. It's, yeah, that's right. Stewie's dad in hospital for a few yeah. days, and Stewie was nearly on yeah. the deathbed as well. So everything becomes uh, hot, becomes cold, cold becomes hot. Yeah. Um, you're forever feeling mm. pretty shitful. Yeah. So if you can't get rid of it, what do you think? You just want to go fish with it. Be careful. Yeah. I just don't eat mackerel. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so you just got to watch what fish Pelagics are more, yeah. and trout, obviously. Yeah. You still eat trout though, don't you? Yeah, well, I'll take the risk for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but, as, like, cobia apparently in Harvey Bay are pretty bad. Yeah. yeah right. So they get it up there, but they don't, we don't hear too much of it down here. Yeah, so, so it's area-related as well. The cobia is one of the only fish, of oh, a snapper as well, but they're one of the main fish that come from that way, believe it or not, and go that way, not the other way around. Yeah. Yeah, so they come with the whales up. But on the way back, we probably get to the northern ones yeah. back on the... <laughs> so they're the ones to maybe watch out of. We get Cobra again about October. Yeah. So, yeah. Any questions on that at all, folks? So we've got Cobia, Jewies. So um, I was going to pull the, the Amberjacks and Kingies. Same deal as the Cobia. Heavy line. Bigger sinkers because you're fishing 100 metres deep or 80 metres deep. You need to get it down. So we'll even use a pound of lead if we have to on the livey and drop it down there. Just on the snapper, do they migrate um, to different depths? Yeah, so they do. Um, they normally start at the 50s first, it's based on water temperature. But I can't explain why the snapper here in late February that we're here, early March, when it's 27 degrees water temperature. Never seen it before. But in the middle of the winter, say June, yeah. would you normally have them in the sort of shallower areas? Or um, they start at the 50 fathoms first because it's colder at the first. Yeah. Then 36s, and then they come here right, around so May. Drops, yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. right. Where well, there's not as many. This year they're just coming close straight away. They haven't, they haven't been started out there that much. There's a few up there, but not the numbers that have been caught in close. Yeah. So um, when you think you've got it all dialed in, still they don't do you. <laughs> which, is, which is good. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, any questions at all, folks, on anything on that? Is there anything you want to know about? Bottom fishing, other than what we've taught, told you? So for the um, Marxic coverage. So oh, yes. Sorry, we were covering that. We no, that's right. Yeah, um, so Sorry. you mentioned you can get curvies in close. Yeah, in close, um, yeah. Numbers, but where would you go? I'd be fishing south, south of the Diamond Reef. So around that sort of 40 to 44 metres. Yeah, okay. Um, and in that sort of 27, 58, 59, 0, 0 area. Yeah. The bottom three, right? Okay. Yeah, those three there, yeah, that's it. So that's if you're targeting them in place. And then yep. aside from that, though, would you be looking at 36s? 100%. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, guys, just a quick question. Uh, a quick uh, thing to the gentleman that spoke about, the, the pearl is on the 36 fathom reef. So 36 fathoms is about, in, east here is about 18 k's out, northeast it's 20, 25. Right at the top end there, it's, it's about 35 k. But um, one thing to note is the Pearlies on the 36 fathoms are always on the outside edge. So we got that 153.37 ridge, this is the outside one here. They'll be on the outside of the outside of the ledge. So where it drops down from, it normally it's about six, the ridge will come up to about 62, from about 65, 66, up to about 62 metres in most areas. And then I'll drop down to about 65, 66 metres. And it's like a slow of that, and then all of a sudden it'll drop down 
to about 71 or 72. So in that, uh, on that about a 1K area, not even, um, it'll be from 65 to about 71, 72. And that's along that edge, look for the wire weed. There's wire weed along there. So zoom your sounder right in. The wire weed looks exactly like this. Sorry, Stu. So if that's your sounder, and you've got your spleen, screen split, and um, we're coming down, we've got a little bit of a rise there, like I said, and we're coming down down that edge, then there might just be a little bit of a drop like that, and it might flatten out a bit. So that's 62, that's 65, that's 68, and this is 71. On that area there, all you need to see is just a little bit of, um, it's normally a green colour or a yellowy green colour, and you'll just see a little bit of a stuff like that on the side like that. It's very minute. But over here on the zoomed inside, so we're just looking at um, this area here. So it'll look like sort of like that sort of thing. And that wire weed will now look like that on the side. All right. And then what we do now is we, um, once you've found that and you put a little mark on your GPS for a little whatever, fish symbol or whatever, on that. You then go to the um, run northwest along it and try and see how far you can run along. If your current's going south, you want to obviously go up into the current as far as you can. So back to the sounder screen and um, still split and still looking at this area here. So the bottom now will be fairly flat because you're running north-south along it. And over here, will be like so. And that wire weed will hopefully be a, like a patch here. And a patch here might go for a bit. And it'll look fairly like that on the bottom. Might be only a metre and a half high. You're looking between zero and, say, 70 metres here. Um, and then over this side here, um, it'll be quite big. So it'll look like that. Like that sort of thing. Does that make sense? And then the fish will be actually in that wire weed. They'll be in here. And very hard to see. You may see some up top here like so. Um, and maybe a few up here like this. Um, but when you start to catch them, next drift you do, these guys come out. And then next time you go along, there'll be a lot, lot more, lot more fish. And it generally dots. They're not like like a solid mass. They dots. That's pearlies. So you're looking for that wire weed that's growing a little. That that bottom actually will go a little bit thick here because it's, it's hard bottom. A little bit thick there. It might be shallow there, a bit thick here. So you know you're on hard bottom. It's all little rock, and that wire weed is growing on that rock. Snapper, completely different. Snapper, you might not have any wire weed and you've had a, a rise here like so and the bottom will be um, complete opposite. The fish, the fish look will be complete opposite too. So now that's sort of looking like that sort of thing. There might be a bit of, bit of yellow stuff around it um, but the fish will be uh, more there might be fish like that on there. They look a bit like mackerel sort of thing. Some sandals will show them a little bit uh, um, semicircle, but most of the time it'll be just lines. Um, there might be bait on top here, on top of the, that reef there, which you'll see a little bit here. You see little dots here, which is that. Um, and there should be some down the side here. But what I like to look for, I'll be obviously there, but I like to try and find a little pinnacle further on or way further up current or back behind it. Um, and those fish that are down there, I find, are the better fish to catch. Here's a lot of fish with the odd good fish, but down here's the bigger fish. Yeah, so they'll be on this little bump over here with a little fish on there, a few fish on there. Does that make sense? Yeah. You, you'll get used to what you're looking at. <coughs> Uh, 
Ah, uh, no, you always, always, always drive into, well, first thing you do, sorry, primatologist, is you have to do a blind drift. You always have to do a blind drift. So, which means you know the location, you're at the mark, but you haven't quite gone over it. So just pull the boat back to neutral, make sure the boat the momentum stops, especially on a good day, and just get your gear ready, rig up your baits, cut up your baits, put them on your lines, ready to roll. You've been, that's taking you five to eight minutes, and you look back at your plotter. That's your plotter there. And, um, and you've maybe had this, this mark here, and another one, little fish here, and maybe another one somewhere here. And you've fished those areas before, and this might be on a, um, say, 200 metres, roughly speaking. So that's sort of 200 metres there. Um, and you've pulled up over here. There's the boat. I'll use the red one, sorry. There's the boat there. You pull up here, little triangle. And the wind's blowing, say, um, southeast, and the current's going south, and you think, well, which is stronger, the wind or the current? You don't know until you actually do that drift. So the wind might be stronger than the current, and, and you might think, OK, um, I'm drifting this way, and, and, and you are. You're actually drifting this way. The wind might be southwest, and you drifted that distance in eight minutes. So when you go back for your next time, you'll go down to probably around here somewhere and start your drift. By the time you hit the bottom, you're down here somewhere, and you're ready to start backing up when you get right near that spot, which will be those fish on the sound that you just saw before. So you start backing up at that point there, um, and your drift's going like this way. Then the next drift you do, you'll start over here and try and nail this one, same scenario. And you're backing up around about here, so your line's slack going through that, that spot there. And you may get some more fish here, like that. Um, and you just sort of cr cross-reference each drift a little bit extra to the next spot, to the next spot. But if you pull up and the, and the winds, um, it's the opposite. You're actually drifting. Some, you always think you drift with the wind because you always think it's stronger than the current. But sometimes um, the current can be stronger than the wind. So you're actually drifting against the wind. And that's when it gets a bit rough sometimes. But um, So you pulled up here and the wind's doing 10 knots that way. And you think, oh, it's a bit of drift to the north. But when you go to go back to your got your gear ready, you go to look at the plotter and you've actually drifted um, that way against the wind. So you think, well, there's a bit of current. So you then need to start your drift up here and, and drift the same angle through those spots. Okay. So you can't just pull up on the spot and drop your line, it doesn't work that way. Unless you've got no wind, no current, and you know exactly where to pull up and drop it. So just do that blind drift, see which way you're drifting. And it does change. Sometimes the wind can be, especially if it's um, like less than 10 knots, it can be southwest, the next minute it's northeast. And you gotta, it stuffs up your whole drift line again. You've got to go the other way. And that's why I say leave all your plot trails on there. So mine's just like, like I know all the time, that's the way I've gone in that wind. That's the way I've gone in that wind. And I know exactly where to start and exactly where to stop. And I might have got that drift. I might have got the fish out here. So I've marked a new little little fish symbol out here, you know, for next time. So you sort of, the more lines, the more easy it is for you to fish it, because you know the, the scenario in that wind, or that current. Don't just wipe off all your plot trail every time you go out fishing. Is that all right? Is there any questions on that one? Okay, everyone's good. Cool. Okay, a couple of little tools the trades do. Oh, I want to show you braid too. So when you're going in that deeper water, you saw how thin that line was around there before? So this is, um, this is 70 pound. But the stick is probably most, say, 30 pounds of five years ago, or 40 pound maybe. All this Japanese stuff is ridiculously good. How much is it? So something like that's about, to you guys, about 69 bucks for 300 metres. Because you get 30 cell off the pricing. Um, and then um, you want to have a fairly decent fill knife. 
think big. <laughs> Be positive. Um, at least a seven or eight inch blade, okay guys? Nothing worse than building a big Dewey or a decent snapper that's that deep with a little tiny knife. Doesn't work very good. Skinning it's even harder. Um, I'm just going to tell you. Um, that's probably it, I think. Oh, when you do your squid, no one's asked how you cut up your bait. There were no pillies. Um, but the squid, depending on the type of squid, if they're like the Californian squid, they're generally literally about this size with the head here and the tentacles. So I'll cut it into about three pieces like that. I always leave one piece attached to the head. So my hook will go through that and then through the head and the legs hang down sort of thing. Um, the middle piece is always good. The end piece to give to your mates. Okay. <laughs> so always grab those two bits first. Um, pillies, as I said before, on the circle hook. That's the circle hook sort of thing. Um, I'll put the eye of the pilly through here. It's the eye of the pilly. His mouth there sort of thing. And it's hanging down like so. And then I'll put the squid on, um, like that piece we saw before, through the body and through the head. And the tentacles are hanging out here sort of thing. Like that sort of thing. Looks a bit dodgy, the big hook, that one. But anyway, I like that style. So the head goes on first of the pilly, and the squid goes on second. <laughs> that's, what it's like. that's why we sell hooks and sinkers and we're not artists. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think that's about it. Any, any questions on tonight? I mean, it's, it's a lot to cover and a lot to... Like, we really haven't gone hardcore on everything, but it gives you the basics of everything you need to do. And the GPS marks. We didn't finish doing this. So, um, getting back to the under 70 metres. So, 27.52 is a really good spot. And that's straight out off about sort of Karaji. Okay? It's north of the seaway just a little bit. Um, and it's a great spot. I get a lot of everything there. I get a lot of trag too. So, the, does anyone here catch trag too? Anyone here caught trag too? Who of you have? So, the ones you're getting close to like this big, the ones you get at 36 fathoms, especially in the afternoon around 60 centimetres or 70 centimetres, they're quite big. And the ones you get out on the under 100 metres, I'll show you about in a spot in a minute, um, they're up to nearly a metre. They're like huge, six kilo. And they fight like crazy. They fight hard, especially you get two at a time. Bag them on, on uh, trags, five per person. Are they running with worms on that side? No, they're not. No, so the worms. Um, <laughs> Certain areas in close they are, but not much out in the deeper water. Yeah. And if they are, just cut them out. They're protein, but cut them out. Yeah. yeah. Um, 27.59 and 01 is sort of off uh, uh, probably Broad Beach or even further down, probably off Burley, I mean, because it's on an angle. And 28.05, you're down way down south of Burley. 28.09, you're, you're off to eat pretty well. Um, you can see that number in the under 70 metres, the top one, 27.38, 153.36, so the 36 is the longitude, is in, if you compare that to the bottom one, which is 28.09, 153.41, it's 10 k's different for the same depth. Because the coast, we're in like a bay, like that shape, and our coastline goes like that out there, it's not dead straight on the depths. So up off jumping pin, it's um, quite close. And as you go to Tweed, Tweed sort of kicks out to the east of it. And so does the 36 fathoms. It's out on a 10 k's more east than, than up off jumping pin. OK, under 100 metres, um, 27.39 is, again, uh, way north of jumping pin. It's up a bit. Um, really good pearly area. 27.42 and 27.43. Um, that's the area where we get a lot of kings, a lot of amberjacks, a lot of snapper, um, and a couple of little medium pearlies. Um, the next one though, 2746 at 153.44, and that one there is a good pearly spot. That one's in a bit deeper of water, I think it's about 88 metres or 90 metres. Um, 2752, uh, another good pearly spot, deeper water about that one's about 98 metres, I think. 
2759, 2800, 2801, all the way down to 01s. So that's like a really good spot to catch kings, amberjack, big trag, and snapper. Okay, that's where C Pro catches a lot of the snapper. So I go that area. Um, and that's where we jig a lot of kings up. That's just north of Fat 13. That's correct. Ah, yeah. uh, no, south. South of Fat 13. South of Fat 13. Uh, so Fat 13's. Um, Fat 13's northeast. Yeah, it's about 2744. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, this is down off sort of surface area. Oh, okay. Yeah, down off surface. Um, it's oh, about. It's near the, near the spot X there, isn't it? Uh, no, further south again. Oh, okay. About another 10 or 15k south. Oh, yeah. 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 So that whole area, 2800 to 2802, um, is the closest area to the 50 fathoms from here. It's about 38k, maybe 40. Um, and it's a really good area to fish. 2805 and 07, again, down south of Burley Heads. Uh, a lot of traps down that area. You'll see floats on the surface, they're fish traps. Because the, the crabbers, uh, the span, uh, the, the New South Wales guys can trap in New South Wales waters, weird as it is, from the Tweed Bar, the the, the horizontal New South Wales borderline goes on an angle north like that. So there, New South Wales is off surface paradise in 50,000. So if you don't have a New South Wales license, not that I see many New South Wales fisheries up that high, but they can book you for not for fishing in. New South Waters, South Waters, off surface. <laughs> Stupid as it sounds. <laughs> I don't know who, who got the go ahead to put the angle like that, but someone did. Um, 2812, so how many guys fish down a tweed here in this area? You guys do? Yeah. So 2812 is um, a bit south of Deep Trag. Um, really good spot for kings, mate, and lots of snapper there in about June, July. Another couple of months yet. 28.14 um, is about off um, Cabrita, probably, nearly. Um, and a good pearly spot. Really good pearlies and snapper there, too. I caught Jewies on that 28.12 spot, like Mulloway, in the 100 metres or 90 metres deep. But I've caught them up off Brisbane out of Morton in 128 metres deep. Mulloway, like Silver Jew, not Trag Jew. So it's quite weird how how different areas hold fish differently. Um, the over 100 metre mark, so that's the pearly spots that were said to be only another. So if you look at similar parallels, so it's a bit, bit hard to get around thinking of math, but the under 100 metres, the third one down, 27.44 and 153.42. Can you all see that? Okay. And then if you go down to the over 100 metres, 27.44, so that's exactly the same latitude but the longitude is 20 is 153.46 that's two more miles about three more k uh east of the inside mark of the 50 fathoms so that's for pearly so it's just a little bit further out you can still see the boats fishing on the 50 fathom reef and uh, for those who haven't been in the 50 fathom reef when the weather's good say you had 10 knots for the day and it's coming out winter when most boats go out there fishing um on a Sunday, there's nothing to, to see 30 boats out there, or 20 boats. A lot of guys come down from Brisbane to fish it as well. So you won't be alone. If it's 20 knots and 6 metre waves, you might be on your own. <laughs> I wouldn't be out there. Um, so does that all make sense, guys? Put it in your GPS and then you understand how it all works. And try and remember where the, what latitude the seaway's on, the jump pin's on, and tweed heads. And what longitude 24,036 and 50 is on. And then you can sort of look at that anything and you can see where you are in your head. If that makes sense. Okay. Uh, let's do, oh, I want to show you this. One more thing. Um, I didn't put these on because I didn't do it. But these, if you want a really super glow bead that really does attract, these are the brightest. I'll pass this around quickly now. They're the brightest you can get. Okay, we've gone into overtime. Any questions at all, folks, on anything on this fishing coming up this season? Okay. I hope you guys get out there. I hope we've helped you fishing. Um, and if you have any questions, please don't be scared to ask us. Um, and we can help you out anytime, anywhere. And just watch our fishing reports. Um, every Thursday night we do it. And you sort of... It's 
from during the week right up to the Thursday afternoon is, is fresh stuff what's been happening that, that week. We try and get out of cells, so then we add that to it as well. Um, and the weather, unfortunately, if we get it wrong, it's because we've gone on what the weather guys say, because we can't say what we think it's going to be, because you guys might get in trouble and we get in trouble. So <laughs> we say what they say. And a lot of time we look like dickheads because it's not, not what's happening. Uh, so um, it, I'm sorry if that's the case. They say it's going to be 30 knots and we do, and it's like five knots, and everyone's slept in, and they'll hit, hit the booze the night before and think, wake up and go, well, Doug, good. <laughs> it's um, just bad luck. Sorry. <laughs> okay, that's it. We're going to do the draw. I don't know if we can find them. So let's put it here. Cool. Thank you, Stewie. Thanks, guys.